Thank you, folks. Appreciate that. Dennis just told me how good I sang, then he didn't invite me to come up and sing with him. So I guess he didn't mean it, did he? Well, that's how it goes. Preacher has to have tough skin, amen? Just the teaser, all right. If you get in the main portion, then I'll help you out. So if you have your Bibles tonight, if you'll turn with me once again to the book of First Peter, First Peter chapter number 3, First Peter chapter number 3, and we're just going to look at a few verses tonight. There are just five verses, verses 18 through 22. But as I mentioned this morning, some of the most, uh, I don't know, controversial, or debated, or discussed passages of all Scripture because it, uh, there are several interpretations of this. And we'll, uh, we'll look, and I'll give you a few interpretations, and then I'll give you my interpretation, which is the right interpretation. Amen? All right. And uh, so you take it for what it's worth, but... Uh, but we look tonight at how to understand the death and the triumph of Christ in the midst of suffering. What we see in this passage tonight, verses 18 through 22, we see the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ. Now, it's important here that Peter is writing this little section. He's already talked about back in chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. As it's like he pauses when he's talking here and he talks a little bit about Christ, about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And that was the hope that these persecuted believers could have that we understand the death of Christ, we understand the resurrection of Christ, we understand the ascension of Christ, we understand where he's at, that uh, Peter talks about Jesus has gone into heaven, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, all angels, authorities, and powers being made subject unto him. And so what Peter is saying, if you're in Christ, then everything's going to be okay. Even though you may be being persecuted or suffering or going through trials or heartaches or tribulations or problems or whatever, as long as you're in Christ, everything's going to be fine. And I think we can say that tonight, amen? As long as we're in Christ, everything's going to be fine. All is well with my soul. All is going to work out. But really we see here, as Peter mentions Jesus, of course, Peter eyewitnessed many of the events of Jesus' life. He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He stayed with Jesus. He, he was there, uh, you know, around the death, the trial of Jesus, the resurrection. He went to the tomb. He, he saw Jesus ascend back to heaven. So he experienced a lot of this firsthand. And, of course, this is a few years later when Peter writes this. But he always has that edge to into his mind, that he was one of the original disciples, the original apostle of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus meant the world to him. And Peter had really come a long way in these many years. And it's almost like he pauses during these passages to just give them a little hope and encouragement about Jesus Christ. It's kind of like preachers sometimes. We like to preach the Bible and different things, but there's nothing like a good old gospel message when you preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Amen? There's nothing like that. Just good old-fashioned looking in there, the gospel preaching. And so really we see Jesus' pathway to glory came through suffering. And our pathway to glory comes through his suffering. It's not that we suffer and that we'll enter glory, but we, we look at his suffering and we're identified with Christ and we, we are united with Christ and we are in Christ. And so because of his suffering, then that's our pathway to glory. You know, as this uh, wall back here says, the way of the cross leads home. But I'll read this in just a moment, but there's a story that, uh, that's been told that illustrates how Christ's triumph presently benefits our lives. Imagine a city under siege, and the enemy that surrounds the city will not let anyone or anything leave. Supplies are running low, and the citizens are fearful. But in the dark of the night, a, smi a spy sneaks through the enemy lines. He's rushed to the city to tell the people that in another place, the main enemy force has been defeated. The leaders have already surrendered. The people do not need to be afraid. It's only a matter of time until the besieging troops receive the news and they lay down their weapons. In a similar fashion, we may seem now to be surrounded by the forces of evil, by disease and injustice and oppression and death. But the enemy has actually been defeated at Calvary. Things are not the way they seem to be. It's only a matter of time until it becomes clear to all that the battle is really over. The battle is almost over. We do have victory through Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection. And this Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander, than Caesar, than Muhammad, Napoleon. Without science and learning, he shed more light on matters human and divine than all the philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since and produced effects which lie beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, he set more pens in motion and furnished themes for more sermons, more discussion, more learned volumes, more works of art, 
more songs of praise than the whole army of great men of ancient and modern times. And as we look at the rest of this chapter 3, we're going to see the classic example of Jesus Christ, the one who suffered for righteousness' sake and reminds us that for him, suffering was the pathway to glory. He never sinned, yet he suffered and died. He began his ministry by being hungry, yet he's the bread of life. He ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty, yet he's the living water. He was weary, yet he is our rest. He paid tribute, yet he's the king. He was accused of having a demon, yet he cast out demons. He wept, yet he wipes away our tears. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, yet he redeemed the world. He was brought as a lamb as a slaughter, to the slaughter, yet he is the good shepherd. Jesus died, yet by his death and his resurrection, he destroyed the power of death. And this is who we look at tonight. Look with me tonight. As we see this great passage of hope and encouragement, and this should give us reason to rejoice and to smile and be happy, because tonight we see that we have a Savior who has died, who has been buried, who has been raised again, who has ascended at the right hand of the Father with all angels, authorities, and powers being made subject to him, that he is the ultimate ruler, the ultimate judge, the ultimate authority, and when we're in Christ, he's all we need. Verse 18, for Christ also has suffered for Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Now, can I get someone to come up here and tell me what's going on here? Amen? There's some tough passages here, so you, you hang with me tonight, and we'll see what they say. Verse number one, we see, as, as through this passage, the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Christ. And what we see really in verse 1, we see why Christ died and what his death does for us. Now remember, Peter's writing to persecuted Christians. They needed to be reminded of this. We, needed to be, we need to be reminded of this. And, and we need an understanding of the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the triumph of Christ that even though things may not look the way we'd like for them to, they may look bleak and dim and doom and, and, and dark and everything else, but we realize there is hope in Christ. We have a blessed hope. Now, he goes back there to verse number 16, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak ill of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. He says in verse 17, For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And then he gives once again an example of Christ, just as he had done in chapter 2. And he gives this example of Christ because he says, Look, Christ suffered for, you know, he, he suffered evil-doing for righteousness' sake. He suffered from evil men. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't sin because he says he's the just one who died for the unjust. He's the righteous who died for the unrighteous. He's the sinless who died for the sinner. He's the innocent who died for the guilty. And so he's saying Jesus didn't do anything wrong, yet he suffered for doing good. And so if Jesus suffered, we may be called on to suffer. But we look here in verse 18. Why did Christ die? And what does his death do for us? He says, for Christ also hath once suffered for sin. Now, when we look at that, we're going to look at some other passages here in just a moment. But when he talks of this, he says Christ suffered and died one time to pay for our sins. That's all that was needed because his death on the cross was sufficient. He didn't have to repeat that. He never has to repeat that. When he died for our sins, the sin question was settled for all of eternity. Aren't you glad for that? Say amen. <clears throat> one time. And now we stand acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. One death is all sufficient, never has to be repeated. When he died on the cross, he satisfied the Father perfectly, completely, and totally. And, and his death covers all of our sin forever. That sin question is settled once for all. The work of redemption is now complete. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. Nothing to add to it, nothing to subtract from it. Christ died, it was a vicarious death, it was a substitutionary death, it was a sacrificial death. Notice there, it says he once suffered for sins, 
the just for the unjust. That's the just one, the righteous one, the holy one, the perfect one, dying for the imperfect, dying for the unholy, dying for the unrighteous, dying for the unjust, the sinless dying for the sinner. But look here, as we see this right here, the wages of sin is death. The judgment and punishment for sin is death. Christ took our penalty. Christ took our penalty. Christ paid our penalty. Christ took our punishment. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Aren't you thankful for that? No condemnation. That's you and that's me for those who have accepted Christ. Now I want you to turn with me this evening to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 4. We're going to look at a couple of passages in the book of Hebrews tonight. We begin Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> with verse number 15. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The just one dying for the unjust. Now turn over with me there in Hebrews to chapter number 7. Chapter 7, verse 24. But this man Christ, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Look at verse 27. Who deedeth not daily as those high priests do offer up sacrifice first for his own sins, and then for the people's, for this he did how many times? He did once. When he offered up himself. Look over in chapter 9. Chapter 9 verse 11. <clears throat> says, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands. That is to say not of this building. Not of this creation. Not of this world. Neither by the blood of goats and calves. But by his own blood he entered how many times? One time. Into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now look over verse 26. Chapter 9, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 28, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So you say, well, why did you read all those verses? Well, I hope you got the thought there, and I hope you got the theme. Because it's saying that Christ went in one time and died for our sins. He'll never come back. He'll never come back and die for the sins of the world again. Okay? He did it one time. That was sufficient. That was all that was needed. It appeased God. It pleased God. God is satisfied with, with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. He's satisfied with the atonement of Christ, with the sacrifice of Christ. So it never has to be repeated again. So he says, for Christ also has once suffered for sins. And then he says here, the just for the unjust. So it shows that we're the sinners, Christ is not. But notice what? This is why Christ died and what his death for, does for us. Our sin has separated us from God. There's a great gulf fix. We cannot stand in the presence of a holy and a righteous and a just God in our sin. We have a sinful nature. We are sinners. We cannot do that. So his death on the cross, look in verse 18, he suffered, he died for us, why? That he might bring us to God. See, Christ is the bridge connecting us with the Father. Isn't that wonderful? And that's saying right there, folks, that there is only one way of salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ. There's no two ways, no three ways, no four ways. One way. It's called reconciliation. We are reconciled to God. God doesn't need to be reconciled to us. He hasn't done anything. We need to be reconciled to God. So we are brought back to God. Christ is that bridge connecting us with the Father. And therefore, because Christ has died for us and suffered for us, our sins are forgiven, our sins are covered, and we stand before God in all the righteousness and sinlessness and perfection of Jesus Christ. The only way you're going to get to heaven, folks, listen up, is through Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the only way, ever will be, there will never be another way. And so, Christ cried from the cross, it is finished. Paul says in Romans chapter 5 in verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, how? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, Christ having made peace through the blood of his cross. 
His suffering is our pathway to glory. So if you look here, being put to death in the flesh, that means he was crucified. His body was crucified. It wasn't a spirit. It wasn't a ghost. It wasn't a phantom. It was his body that he had on earth. In the incarnation that he had in the manger, that was the body that was crucified. So he's once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Why? That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. Now there's why Christ died, what his death does for us. Now the last part of verse 18 down through verse 22 we begin to see the triumph of Christ. But look at the last part of verse 18. It says, but quickened by the Spirit. Quickened by the Spirit. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the Spirit of God, never to die again. And you know, when we're born again, we are regenerated. Our spirits are made alive. They are quickened. If you don't believe me, turn with me to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2 and we'll read a couple of verses there. In Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, for even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you are saved, has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to read the rest of that. You know many of those passages there. But what he's saying here is Jesus Christ was raised, Holy Spirit, raised, quickened, made alive, never to die again. And so we see people in the Bible that were raised from the dead, but they died again. Jesus Christ, when he was crucified, he was placed in a grave. The third day he rose again. They searched his body. You know, I saw a little uh, something on television the other day. I think there's a movie coming out, a uh, Risen or something with Jesus. And, and just one little clip I saw. I think it must have been Pilate or, or one of the Romans. They, they, they came and they came to the disciples and they said, you tell us where his body's at. We searched all over here and we can't find his body. Well, let me tell you something, folks. You can go search today and you're not going to find his body, amen? You're not going to find his bones. You're not going to find his body anywhere in the grave. Because if you do, we lock the doors of this church tomorrow. Did you know that? Because we've been lied to, we've been deceived, we've been led astray. But because he is raised, we have hope. And that's what Peter's... Uh, emphasizing here to these Christians who are being persecuted. He's emphasizing here, yeah, he died for you to bring you to God. You were the sinner. He was the sinless one, but he's been raised. Now, the Spirit here, I believe, is referring to the Holy Spirit of God. Now, let's go into verse 19. Here's where it gets fun. Verse 19, by which, that's going back to the Spirit, by which the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also he, Christ, went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, I told you this morning I was going to give you 21 interpretations, and then I cut it down to 20, but tonight I'm going to give you three. Does that sound better? Now, there's different interpretations on this. You may agree with me, you may not. I don't think it's anything to get uh, hussy about. But uh, let me give you a few interpretations of this. And hang with me here. Some people believe that when Jesus, between his death and resurrection, that Jesus literally descended into hell. And they take that from Ephesians chapter 4, where he descended the lower parts of the earth. Could be, probably talking about coming to earth. But, you know, I've talked about this before. You see this with the rich man and Lazarus in the, in the Gospel of Luke. I believe before the ascension of Christ, you had two compartments in Hades, so to speak. You had, for the, for the saved, you had what was known as paradise. And you had for the lost, which was known as Hades, or we would say hell. Now, I believe when Jesus ascended, he took those Old Testament saints, those souls that were in paradise, he took them with him to heaven. So today, that paradise section is empty. So we, we don't have to worry about that, okay? And so when we die today, our soul, our spirit, goes directly to be with the Lord. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But this Hades section hell section for the lost, that hasn't been changed. That's still the same because you look in the book of the Revelation, it says hell will give up its dead. Hell will deliver up its dead and they will be judged at the great white throne judgment. They're awaiting final judgment. They will be judged according to their works and will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, the reason I say that is some people believe that between the death and resurrection of Christ, that Christ descended actually into hell. That he went there as spirit and he went into hell and he proclaimed the gospel to those unbelieving spirits that were in prison, so to speak, awaiting the final judgment. Now, 
That's an interpretation that I totally reject. And the reason I reject that is because the Bible nowhere teaches in any of Scripture that there is a second chance after death. Because if not, then you get into purgatory, you get into universal salvation, you go back to the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man, did he have a second chance? No. Remember he cried out, Abraham, send someone to my brother. But he, he didn't have a second chance, okay? There are no second chances once you die. So what is that interpretation? Throw that one out. I don't believe that because that would give a second chance to someone, okay? It, it's like a holding state of purgatory. Now, there's a second interpretation, which I, I could agree some to. And this is that Jesus went in to that section of Hades uh, before his resurrection, and he proclaimed triumph. You know, we're talking about triumph, which that could go along with that. Many good scholars believe this. One of the commentaries I read, I actually had the guy for a class at seminary, a very smart guy, but I don't really agree with him on this. And he says, well, they went into, he went in there and, and he proclaimed triumph, that the way of salvation was valid and that uh, God's salvation was complete and Jesus was going to be raised. And, and he's just simply uh, saying that it's, it, it's a triumph right there. Jesus has conquered all. Well, that could be true. But I hold to a different interpretation. And I'm in pretty good company here because when I preached this before, I wrote in my notes that I called my grandfather. My grandfather preached about 60 years. And I called and asked him about this, and he has the same interpretation that I hold to. So I'm in pretty decent company, okay? Now, I believe what he's talking about here is it's talking about the actual days of Noah, that Christ preached through Noah, okay? Because if you look at that passage, and I'll tell you why. If you look back in chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 1 of 1 Peter, look back in chapter 1. Look back at chapter number 1. It says, verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should, be, should come unto you, searching what or what manner time, look here, the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, preaching through the Old Testament prophets, did signify when it testified before and the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Okay? In Christ pre-incarnate, Christ always existed. Okay? Now, turn with, turn with me back to 1 Peter chapter 3. If you look at this passage, by which the Holy Spirit, also he, Christ, went and preached, I believe through Noah, unto the spirits, and they're now in prison. When he preached to them at that time, they were not in prison. They were living human beings. This was before the flood. And that Christ preached through Noah, as Noah proclaimed the, the gospel, the warning of God for 120 years, there's going to come a flood, you're going to be destroyed unless you accept God and believe God, and no one listened to him because he says here in verse 20, which sometime were disobedient. When? Once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. I don't think you can get around that. I think it's actually talking about the literal days of Noah. And what it is is Christ preached through there, preached through Noah, and for those who did not believe, they perished in the flood. Only those on the ark, eight souls, Noah, his wife, three sons and their wives, they're the only ones who were saved. And we'll get into that a little more here in just a moment. I know my time's getting out, but, but just hang with me just a moment. Because in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, Noah is called a preacher of righteousness. Now, you have to really dig deep on this, but he's called a preacher of righteousness. That's the same root word that is used here for Christ preaching to the spirits in prison. So I don't think you can get around that right there, okay? And so I believe it's talking about where Christ's spirit preached through Noah in these days. And we're going to talk about the ark in just a second, so just, just hang on with me right here. But they rejected the message, and now these living beings who were, who were alive in Noah's day, they perished in the flood. Now they are spirits in prison awaiting the final judgment. How many of you still with me say amen? Well, I lost some of you, didn't I? But I believe that's what it's talking about there. I believe it's talking about the spirit of Christ preaching through Noah in the days of Noah. Uh, now, could Jesus have gone into Hades and, 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 and said, you know, he's conquered, that this is the way of salvation? Sure, he could have. That might be the right interpretation. I don't know. But I just think this passage speaks of that. Now, let me go on here. It says, by which also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. The spirits who are in prison now, they're, they're now spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. So this is sometime in the past. When, I think that's the key word right there, when, once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. And you know, you have to, I believe you have to take that literally right there. 
that he's talking about the actual days of Noah and says while the ark was preparing. How many arks did they build in the Bible? They built one, didn't they? Okay. Now, they're building one in northern Kentucky right now, but uh, that's after this has been written, okay? But, but this was talking about when they built the ark. While the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, they were saved through water. Now, let's go, we'll go to the next passage. If you're not confused yet, I'm going to confuse you now. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. And we go down by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and there's parentheses, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. So you're saying, well, is, is, is Peter teaching here that baptismal regeneration, that we have to be baptized in order to be saved? Is that what he's saying? That's not what he's saying, okay? Jesus was baptized into death. What he's saying here is what baptism symbolizes, that's what saves us. When we baptize someone, we're buried with Jesus in baptism identifying with his death, with his burial, and then we're raised to walk in newness of life, we're identified with his resurrection, okay? Now, let's go to the ark for just a moment. <clears throat> was the water is what, did the water save Noah and his family? No, water didn't, water was the judgment of God, okay? That's what destroyed the people. That's what destroyed the earth was the water, okay? Noah and his family got into the ark. The ark is a picture, a type of Christ. Because no water entered the flood, then the judgment of God did not affect Noah and his family. Are you with me? Noah and his family were saved and delivered. Why? Because they were in the ark. Why did they get in the ark? They got in by faith. Are you with me? They got in by faith. Noah built the ark. It never rained before. But he kept building. People thought he was crazy. But God vindicated Noah and his family when he rescued them. Okay, Noah and his family not only built the ark, but they went into the ark by faith. Did they know the ark was going to hold up? I don't know, but they had to trust God. They had to go by faith. And so I think the like figure here, Christ bore the judgment of God for us, didn't he? He bore the brunt of the storm, the, the waters of judgment here. And so if we are in Christ and we, we are in Christ, then the judgment of God does not affect us like the water did not affect Noah. So you have to be in Christ, and the judgment of God does not harm you. You're saved. You're delivered. See, only those in the ark were saved. All those on the outside perished. They're now spirits in prison in Hades awaiting the final judgment. So only those of us who are in Christ are saved. Those on the outside of Christ they will perish. Now, why would Peter write this? What did he say? Look, I'm writing this because those who are persecuting you, you need to live this good example for them. You need to always give an, a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear because these people are going to perish just like they did in the days of Noah. Are you with me? So, so he's saying here, here here's what's going to take place. So, you know, you don't need to condemn them and, and backbite and gossip and so on. You need to share the gospel with them. That's what Noah did. That's what Noah tried to do, but they didn't listen. They didn't pay attention. And finally, one day, the rain started, and God shut the door, and, and those people on the outside perished. So what he's saying here is we're not saved by water because water can clean on the outside, but it can't clean on the inside. We're saved through the water, spokesman. We're saved through the judgment of God, just as Noah was saved through the judgment of God because he was in the ark, because we are in Christ. So he says we have a good conscience by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't say we don't, have, we don't have a good conscience because we're baptized in water. We have a good conscience because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, if God raised Jesus from the dead, then the resurrection tells us that God is fully satisfied with Christ's redemptive work. And so if Christ has died for us and forgiven us and saved us, then we have a good conscience. We know our sins are forgiven. We know that, that, we know that we're going to heaven. We know that we have a place in heaven. We know that we have eternal life. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he wasn't raised from the dead, we don't have that hope. And so I think this is what Peter is saying right here. And he's not talking about being that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Now, I think we do that as the next step in obedience to his command. But folks, I don't know one drop of water in here that will save your soul. Do you know that? Not one drop of water. Because then we're saying, well... Jesus, your death on the cross is not sufficient. I have to add something to it. So, I'm going to move on from there. 
And I know my time is up, but I have one more verse. Can you hang on with me one verse? So it'll take me about 40 minutes, okay? But, but, but those are difficult passages. So, so you take whatever interpretation, but I think what I mentioned there about Christ preaching through, no, I think it all fits in with what's taking place in Peter's day and time. You know, if I'm wrong, we'll get to heaven one day, and, and I'll learn the right thing. But look at, look at the last part of verse 21. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who, referring back to Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Now, remember, Peter saw Jesus ascend into heaven. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, Jesus says Jesus seated at the right hand of God. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, Jesus seated at the right hand of God. And so we see right here, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, the place of power and position and privilege and majesty and honor and authority right here. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So what he's saying here is, look, you may be going through a tough time, and you may, be, you may have some heartaches, and I say this to you today. Tonight, you go through some tough times, heartaches, sorrows, whatever it may be, keep your eyes on the death of Christ. Keep your eyes on the cross. Not only on the cross, but keep it on the resurrection. Keep it on the ascension of Christ. Because he was not only, he not only died for our sins, and, and that battle was won there at Calvary, but he was raised from the dead, and God vindicated that, and God was pleased with his death, with his atoning sacrifice, and raised him from the dead. But not only that, took him back to heaven. People say, well, let's, let's go try to find the body of Jesus. Well, where are you going to find him? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's waiting for that day when the father tells him, son, it's time to go get your children, amen? It's time to go get them, and we're going to rise out of here. That's triumph, and that's what we're talking about. We need to understand the death and the triumph of Jesus Christ. And if we're in Christ, we have victory, we have triumph, because he's, going to be, he's been raised, he's ascended. And one day he's going to come in the clouds, and we're going to hear a shout, and we're going to go up and meet him in the air. Isn't that wonderful? We're going to meet him there. We're going to be with the Lord forever and ever. The dead in Christ is going to rise first. You know what? That's going to be a glorious day. And I'm always wondering, I wonder what the major media outlets are going to do. wonder how they're going to cover that. wonder what they're going to say about that. wonder if they're going to mock and ridicule now. wonder if they're going to laugh at people now when we come out of here on a cloud of glory and we go out just like Elijah went out. In that chariot of fire, we're going to go out and triumph in glory because we're in Christ. A couple of passages of scripture, and I'll quit. I, got, I love to preach this, so if I go over time tonight, just don't pay attention to me, okay? You go sleep on me, and then I'll, I'll say something. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 through 23, and then I have one more passage to read. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And then you know what I'm going to read next. You can close your eyes, bow your head. Listen to these passages. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. Given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus. Every knee. I'm talking folks. Presidents. I'm talking religious leaders. I'm talking great senators. I'm talking, talking kings and popes. I'm talking emperors. I'm talking athletes, I'm talking entertainers, I'm talking atheists, I'm talking Scientologists, I'm talking Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims, that in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I don't know about you folks, but that's triumph. That's victory. As Paul concludes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, and he says, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we need to understand the death and the triumph of Jesus Christ. No matter what we go through, no matter the trials, the tribulations, the problems we face, 
Everything should be well with your soul if you're in Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you tonight. Lord, we thank you for these passages of scriptures that gives thrill to our hearts and to our minds and to our souls that we know. We know who we belong to. We know our future. We know our destiny. We know our eternity. And Lord, we're placing our whole eternal destiny and future in your hands because we believe you. And we believe you are who you say you are. We believe you did die for our sins and was raised from the dead, quickened by the Spirit, ascended back to the right hand of the Father. We know that you rule over all angels and authorities and powers. You're the ultimate ruler and judge and authority. And we believe in Scripture that teaches us that one day you'll come in the air and we'll go to meet you and that you're coming again for us because you promised us that you prepared a place for us, that where you are, that's where we're going to be. And, Lord, that gives us great hope and encouragement and confidence tonight. I pray tonight if there's one here without Christ, Father, may you speak to their heart. May they realize, Lord, their need of a Savior. And may they believe that Jesus did die for them, was buried, and rose again. May they place their faith and trust in Christ. Just as Noah and his family got into that ark by faith, help us, Lord, to get in the ark of Jesus by faith. Father, I pray if there's any other needs here tonight, may you speak to people's hearts. And may they respond publicly and do what you've called them to do. Thank you once again, Lord, for all you do for us. And thank you for the wonderful salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. Will you stand with me tonight? What number, Bill?